I am not saying that the time has come. I am saying look at the signs and do not panic, but lift your eyes to God and give Him glory for the power He is showing you. Do not panic because He is still in control. I repeat, do not panic. God is still in control. If you walk in righteousness, you have nothing to be afraid of. Shalom. I am Brother Dan, and you are watching a video series called Biblical Revelations – God's Master Plan versus Satan's Deceit. I just follow the Bible to whatever unexpected place it takes me. Because if you love truth, you let it change you, and Jesus is truth. The priests and the Pharisees, when Jesus walked this earth, they thought they knew what Messiah would be like, but they did not. They were not stupid, you know. They knew the scriptures. They just did not love the truth enough to let it take them wherever God wanted. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 11 and 12. They had ears, but did not hear. They had eyes and saw miracles, but did not understand what Jesus was doing. It is happening again nowadays with Christians. They have heard so many doomsdayers that it wore them out. The Antichrist wears out the saints, so it is a work of the Antichrist. They have heard so many sermons about the Antichrist and the little horn that they have come to believe that they know how the Antichrist will behave and even look. They expect a handsome guy, strong and almost nerdy smart, standing in a Judaic temple in Jerusalem. A Superman figure who can lift immense weights and acts nerd in his private life. A charming guy who has all of the answers. The Bible does not say that he will be handsome or with a lot of muscle. And even if Israel's government builds a temple in Jerusalem, God will not be there. So it is not relevant for the Antichrist either, he has nothing to profane there. God does not live anymore in temples built by hands. Acts 17.24 This war between good and evil is older than the mankind. I will start with the origin of sin and how Lucifer rebelled. This material will end with Jesus destroying the Antichrist and then God destroying death. To sum it up, it is about an angel trying to achieve godhood by inventing a lethal weapon called sin. Now don't tell me that sin is not lethal, because whoever sins dies. That is what the Bible teaches in Romans 5 verse 12. Before everything was created, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed for an eternity already. How? Well, that's pretty easy to understand if you believe what Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, that He is the truth. Let us explain eternity through the concept of truth. Since when does 2 plus 2 equal 4? Since forever. 
even before humanity discovered that 2 plus 2 is 4. That was true for an eternity and will be true forever. God lived for an eternity before he started creating the world. And from now on, he will live as much as he lived until now, meaning an eternity. Truth is eternal. Jesus is truth. Jesus is eternal. So, God the Father loved his son so much that he decided to create a world for him to rule. We read in Romans 11 verse 6. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. That is pretty straightforward. Everything that exists was made for the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ, and also the Word of God, who was made flesh, lived a perfect human life, died for our sins, was resurrected and ascended to heaven. We know that a spiritual world was created first because in Job 38 verse 7, the angels sing when the material world is created. So the spiritual world preceded this world, otherwise that verse makes no sense. Let's stop for a moment at the creation of the spiritual world. God decided to create the perfect angel, and he was a cherub and a musician, a very beautiful cherub. In Ezekiel 28, God speaks to the king of Tyre, and in verse 14, we find out that the true king of Tyre was a cherub, and God tells us about the fall of that cherub. God looked behind that king of Tyre at Satan. And he spoke to him about his doom, the same way Jesus looked at Peter and spoke to Satan in Matthew 16, verse 23. We know that Lucifer was a musician from Ezekiel 28, verse 13, because the musical instruments were ready before Lucifer was made. You may pause to check the references. Verse 17 from the same chapter 28 tells us that Lucifer was so beautiful that he let his beauty corrupt his wisdom. In today's terms, he became a narcissist. Verse 12 tells us that Lucifer was perfect, so he thought that in his perfection, he does not need God anymore. And because he was also perfect in beauty, he thought that he could be like God, according to Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer wanted to achieve Godhood. What was his plan to succeed? It's about the mystery of iniquity. You may ask yourself why God allowed Lucifer to develop those thoughts. Because even Jesus Christ was tested. And Lucifer is no exception to God's testing. And Lucifer's test was himself, because he was perfect. God wanted to see if Lucifer was thankful for those gifts that made him perfect. But Lucifer was proud, not thankful. And why did the other angels follow him? They might have idolized him instead of worshipping God, like so many religious leaders nowadays are idolized. This is not an eternal war, as Hollywood likes to label it. It has a beginning and God will put an end to it. Satan will burn forever. So Lucifer came up with a plan to achieve Godhood. He invented a weapon that can kill everything, and that weapon is sin. He hoped to kill God with it. God is the author of holiness, and Satan is the author of sin. 
I think that we can all agree on this. Nobody was holy before God and nobody sinned before Lucifer. To whom do you pay your royalties? To the author of holiness by being the slave of righteousness? Or to the author of sin by being a slave to sin? You cannot be your own master because from the moment you are not a slave of God, you are considered proud, pride is a sin, and then you're back in the loop, a slave to sin serving Satan. We read Romans 6 verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? You may remember that I have said that sin is a weapon. We read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. See, it is a sting, a small weapon that is lethal a deadly weapon. Avoid getting stung. And Lucifer is the only one that holds the power of death. We read Hebrews 2 verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Because the devil invented sin and because sin is lethal, the devil has the power of death. Jesus has the power of resurrection, the keys of death and Hades, but the power of death is held by the devil. You might see that in the image I am showing you. It says, holding. Lucifer also wanted to show if his weapon was truly lethal, so he killed somebody with it. We don't know who it was, another angel, or if it was himself. We know that he killed somebody. Jesus told us in John 8 verse 44 that Satan is a murderer. So he must have killed somebody because those are Jesus' words about Satan. Lucifer's plan to achieve godhood was pretty solid. Make God descend from glory into flesh like in Philippians 2 verse 7. Try to make him sin through temptation or keep him imprisoned after killing him like in Acts 2 verse 24. If God did not have the love he claimed he had, the devil would be a winner today. You can tempt Jesus in the desert, you can starve him, throw prostitutes at his feet, shame him, slap him in the face, beat him almost to death, and then crucify him. God will not sin. Jesus is God. Jesus did practice what he preached. God cannot sin, so Lucifer lost his bet at Golgotha, and his plan failed. Lucifer's rebellion was no accident. He wanted to be like God. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 tells us that in heaven everything is known fully. It is the world of truth. So the angels that followed Lucifer knew what they were doing. They chose to sin fully aware of the consequences. So Lucifer was perfect, we are told in Ezekiel 28. And he also knew the consequences of his actions fully, because he lived in heaven where everything is fully known. Because he was perfect and he was fully aware of what sinning would do, sin worked in him at full potential. There is none in which sin works so much evil as it does in the devil, and you cannot sin and control the sin to work only in certain areas of your life. It takes over. The perfect creation overtaken by sin became Satan, the perfect enemy of creation and, in consequence, the enemy of the Creator. 
if a lesser creation would have seen first, maybe sin would have been weaker and its work in the sinner would have been lesser. I am saying maybe because it is just a speculation. The fact remains that Lucifer is the author of sin and we will never know the possible alternatives. It is what it is. Maybe you have asked yourself, Lucifer sinned and became evil. Adam sinned and he did not become evil. He just became a sinner. What is the difference between a sinner and an evil demon? The answer has something to do with the mystery of iniquity. If you remember, I have said that in heaven everything is known according to 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. And because of that, the angels that sin were fully aware of their decision. They wanted to serve Lucifer, hoping that Lucifer would achieve godhood, as I have said earlier. I have also said that the devil wanted to kill God, and he succeeded. It's just that Jesus did not stay dead. He is risen and lives forever. Killing God was the ultimate evil the devil could orchestrate, so he did just that. What he did not know was that Jesus would not stay dead. Lucifer sinned and he became evil. Adam sinned and he did not become evil. Why? Lucifer was fully aware of his decision and he has done it to bring into creation something unheard of, and that is death, hoping to achieve godhood. But Adam was tempted. Adam did not know everything fully, because in this world everything is dimmer, according to 1 Corinthians 13.12. Lucifer was not tempted by anyone, it was his idea to achieve godhood. There is a difference, right? And because of that difference, sin did not work its inner doings in Adam at full strength as it did in Lucifer. It could have worked the same in Adam as it did in Lucifer, but God did not allow it. We read this very important passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 7 to 12. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Pleasure in unrighteousness. Sin brings you pleasure. That is why it is addictive, even if it is deadly. It is more powerful than any drug and even more dangerous. And the worst part of it? You can sin even if you have no money or gold, but in the end you pay with your life. How do you know that you love the truth of the Bible so you are not in a strong delusion? You let the truth change you, that's how. You do not twist the truth to fit your sinful life, but you let it change you, even if it means killing your old self. If anyone is in Christ, 
is a new creation, says the Bible in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. And in Romans 6 verse 6, we read about the old self being crucified with Christ. All right, so the iniquity, the lawlessness is still a mystery, a secret for humans. How is it a mystery if there is iniquity on earth? Paul says that yes, it is already at work, but there must be something more about iniquity that we do not know, otherwise it would not be called a mystery. And it is not yet revealed because the Holy Spirit is in its way. When He is taken out of the way, then iniquity will no longer be a mystery. It is logical, is it not? It makes sense. And how will it be revealed? Through a man, the Antichrist, called the man of lawlessness. When the mystery is revealed, humans will know iniquity. For demons, there is no mystery of iniquity. The demons know sin at its full strength, and it is so addictive that no demon has ever repented. There is no repentance for demons, so there is no salvation for them. They knew what sin would do to them, they lived in the world of truth, in heaven, yet they followed Lucifer against God. God has no choice but to throw them in the everlasting fire, like it is written in Matthew 25 verse 41. If your sins are not forgiven on earth by repenting and accepting the sacrifice of Jesus, the end of your life, you die in your sins. You fall under the same judgment as the devil, and God has no choice but to throw you into the same fire. I think that this is so well known that we do not have to go in depth. But I will read two verses. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26, and then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, Revelation 20 verse 14. The ultimate goal of the everlasting fire is to destroy death. The everlasting fire, the lake of fire, is also called the second death. The first death is the death brought forth by sin. The second death is the death of death, the lake of everlasting fire. Sin will be quarantined in the lake of fire. No evildoers will be outside of it. That's pretty clear. God is just. I'm going to tell you something incredible. Sin has a genealogy. Like every man alive has ancestors, sin has a genealogy too. We know that the devil is the author of sin, so he is the father of it, like in John 8 verse 44. Does sin have a genealogy? Yes, we read in James 1 verses 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. We see that in that passage, James talks about sin in genealogical terms. Desire has conceived, he tells us, and it gives birth to sin. Is it not like a spiritual genealogy? If you like to live in sin and not repentance, then you are one of Satan's children. And then when you act upon it, sin gives birth to death. Death? Yes, sin takes your life. And it is resurrected by taking your life. We read in Romans 7 verse 9, I was alive once without the law, but then the commandment came. Sin revived and I died. What does this have anything to do with the law? We also have read that the strength of sin is the law. 
So what does that mean? Because there is a law, there is a boundary set by that rule. And that is the exact reason why you are enticed by your desire to cross the line. And because the punishment is death, you get death for breaking the law. Sin is something real. Without being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, you cannot stop sinning. Even then you make mistakes. If sin were something imaginary, you could ignore it. But it is real and it has power over your heart. Sin proves in a way God's existence because no one can stop sinning by its own will. The existence of Israel is another proof that the Jews have returned to Israel after almost 2,000 years of exile, just like it was prophesied in Ezekiel 37 verse 21-22. Anyway, Let's get back to explaining the sin. The next verse is in Romans 7. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. That is pretty clear now, is it not? Because there is a rule, you are deceived by sin to break the rule, and you die, and the sin is revived. Sin comes with a false promise, an illusion. We read in Proverbs 9, verse 17, Stolen water is sweet. It is a lie, an illusion. If you steal water, the water does not become sweet. Water has no taste, no smell, and no color. When you steal water, it does not gain taste, it does not become sweet. But the idea of doing something forbidden like stealing is making it sweeter in your mind. It is an illusion. Nonetheless, it first starts in your mind. So, it is the child of a forbidden desire and your will to cross the line. But that limits the power of the soon-to-be-born sin to what you know about the rule you're breaking. If you know less, the power of sin has less effect. But when you act upon that sin, the union between sin and action becomes death. There is no little death, even if the sin had less power over someone who had no in-depth knowledge of the law of God, death is death. The punishment is not the same for a child who sins, or for a fully grown man, but in the end, death is death. Read Luke 12 verses 47 and 48. In nature, there is a fungus called cordyceps. You may Google it. That fungus is tiny and microscopic. When an insect is infected with cordyceps, the fungus takes control of the mind of the host. This is no joke. Google it. It makes the insect climb up high on a tree, clench its jaws on the tree, and then it kills the insect by erupting through the body. Days ago, a spore landed on this ant. Now she's acting strange. A network of roots has infiltrated her muscles. Her body has been taken over by cordyceps. A parasitic fungus.
floods her brain with chemicals, drugging her, compelling her to head where conditions are perfect. Just the right amount of light. Just the right amount of humidity. For the parasite growing inside. It forces her to clamp down in a death bite. And cordyceps reveals its gruesome nature. Three weeks of growth, Cordyceps can release its own spores, infecting more ants. Scene controls you too if you do not accept the sacrifice of Jesus and get baptized. Scene takes your life, scene is revived, and you die. When sin has control over your life, you are like a puppet in the hands of the puppeteer, which is the devil, the inventor of sin. We have also read that sin brings you pleasure. I mean, that's the whole point of being tempted. It entices you with the pleasure of breaking the rules set by God. Pleasure should be the reward for doing good, not for doing evil. That's why fire is the perfect punishment. It cuts the axis of the evildoer to pleasure and gives him pain instead, being tormented in front of the Lamb and before the angels, like it is written in Revelation 14 verse 10. Until then, somehow, this devilish invention called sin hacks its way into pleasure. And when the mystery of iniquity is revealed, people will be as evil as the demons because they will know its full power and they will have the pure pleasure of doing evil. At some point, people will drink blood. That's how bad iniquity will get in the end times, according to Revelation 16, verse 6. Normal people would rather die of thirst than drink blood. But when the mystery of iniquity is revealed, drinking blood is no longer a moral issue. It will be an attraction. Even more. People will not repent. Read Revelation 9 verses 20 and 21. In the same way, demons do not repent and they never do anything but evil. Otherwise, their kingdom would not endure, according to Luke 11 verse 18. They are slaves to sin, meaning slaves to the author of sin, the devil, and they do his will. The Antichrist, the lawless one, will be the one who will be revealed at the same time with the mystery of lawlessness. The two are very connected. God has his mysteries, like the mystery of faith in 1 Timothy 3 verse 9, the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy verse 16. But Satan has a mystery of his own, and he wants to reveal it to the whole world as soon as possible. Only the Holy Spirit, God, stand in its way. But at the end times, it will be revealed through the Antichrist. If you think that people are evil now, imagine how they will be when iniquity will manifest itself at full strength in them. Stolen water is sweet, we read in Proverbs. And I have said that people will not repent according to Revelation 9 verse 20 and 21. Why will they be unable to repent? It will be the receiving of the mark of the beast, which will trigger the revelation of the mystery of iniquity in them. 
Sin is like a disease of the mind and it controls you. You cannot control it. Its power is irresistible. Pop artists sing about it because they are in Satan's domain. If you carefully read the lyrics of Love on the Brain or Disturbia, both by Rihanna, you now realize that she is singing about the revealing of the mystery of iniquity. The music industry is demonic. Thank you for watching. Please share this episode and see you on the next episode.